My name is Angela Scholar, and I am going to read my translation of an extract from a letter in French by Frederick the Great of Prussia on the subject of the education of the young. I turn now to the female sex, which exercises so remarkable an influence on the male. If in a free and civilized, civilized society, the foremost nobility does not recognize the opprobrium that the conduct of a daughter without morality and virtue will bring upon her family. If this is so, it is something for which their most distant posterity will reproach them eternally. Let us be under no illusion. The dissolute conduct of women has its origin in the idle life that they lead rather than in the warmth of their temperament. Spending two or three hours in front of a mirror, appraising, improving and admiring their own charms. Passing the whole afternoon in spiteful talk, then going to the theatre, then in the evening to the gaming table, then finally to supper and more gambling. Does this leave them time for self-examination? Does not the boredom of its easy and idle life encourage them to pleasures of another kind, even if only in search of variety or the experience of some new feelings? Keeping mankind busy is the best way of protecting it from vice. Life in the countryside, simple, rural and hard, is more innocent than that led by a crowd of idlers in the great cities. It is a well-established adage of generals that to prevent licentiousness, disorderly conduct and rebellion in camp, you must keep the soldier busy. Men are all alike. If we are not so foolish as to make do no distinction between the licentious conduct of our fellow men and their wise and discreet behaviour, we must teach them all to keep busy. A young girl may amuse herself with women's concerns, with music and even with dancing. But we must also, and above all, apply ourselves to shaping her mind, to giving her a taste for good works, for exercising her judgment. We should encourage her to cultivate her reason by reading serious works and persuade her that there is no shame in learning household economics. It is better that she take charge of the household accounts herself and that she keep them in order rather than that she contract carelessly debts on every side without considering paying back what the good faith of her creditors long ago had advanced to her. I must confess to you that I am often indignant when I consider the degree to which, in Europe, we misjudge this half of the human race, even to the point of denying them everything that could improve their minds. We see so many women who are not outdone by men. There are in the present century various princesses who greatly excel their predecessors. There are, but I dare not name them, for fear of displeasing them by offending their extreme modesty, which is the crowning glory of all their virtues. Given a more masculine, a more robust education, the female sex would outstrip our own. It possesses the charms of beauty, but are not those of the mind to be preferred? Let us come to the point. Society cannot survive without legitimate marriage, which renews and perpetuates it. We must, therefore, nurture the young plants we are growing so that they may become the foundation of our posterity and in such a way that the male and the female may fulfill equally the duties of heads of families. It is essential that reason, intelligence, talent, morality and virtue should serve equally as the basis of this education. 
so that those who have profited from it may pass it on to those to whom they give life. 